Our last presenter is Mark Hinshaw, FAIA and FAICP, which you'll learn about in just a moment. Mark has had an influential career spanning architecture, planning, and journalism. His election to the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows in 1994 recognized the unique professional fusion that has made him effective as Bellevue's city architect during the formative decade of his tenure there, beginning in 1982. He served as the AIA Seattle president from 92 to 93. He's also been elected as a fellow in the American Institute of Certified Planners. He earned his bachelor's degree in architecture at the University of Oklahoma and his master's in urban planning at Hunter College of the City University of New York. More recently, he has served as the Director of Urban Design with LMN Architects in a consulting practice that spans design and planning. He's gained increasing prominence and regard as a speaker and writer in a variety of local, national, and international media, while his popular column in the Seattle Times has brought Seattleites a fresh look at the phenomena of their own city Designers from around the nation and the world have gained their impressions of Seattle's urban achievements from his writings in architecture, architectural record, landscape architecture, and other professional journals. Mark has described the influences that have shaped his unique way of looking at cities as observer and problem solver in a wide-ranging view that spans the urban horizon from public policy to social psychology. In addition to his consulting in communities around the Northwest, Mark Hinshaw lectures widely on the subject of urban design at conferences and workshops. Please welcome Mark Hinshaw. Thanks, Janet. Uh, I just realized that bio is now slightly out of date. Uh, the Seattle Times dropped me uh, six years ago uh, after a 12-year stint uh, writing a monthly column on real estate development and planning. Uh, if you read it during that time, um, which was, I really enjoyed that, that stint, uh, you may not realize that um, I picked up quite, a, quite a, a following. People didn't know I was even an architect or planner. They thought I was just a, a journalist. And I noticed that I was grad gradually getting better and better service in restaurants. <laughs> and I couldn't figure this out. Well, it finally dawned on me that they ran my headshot next to my byline and I started to get facially recognized. Well, the restaurant staff would be whispering over in the corner and they'd go, I think he might be the food critic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is some benefit to be a, being a journalist I discovered unexpectedly. Um, what I'd like to do, even though um, I identify as an architect, I wanna share with you some thoughts um, that I have in, in, a, in a sense bigger than, than buildings and streets and neighborhoods. And that's some pretty fundamental things that are going on in our culture right now. We are actually in a very transformative period that is shifting dramatically from the last 50 years to the next 50 years. And it's quite stunning in many respects. It started to actually show up in the 1990 census. It was very clear by the 2000 census absolutely crystal clear by the most recent census in 2010. I'll get to that in a minute. There's also the issue that is facing us virtually every day now of climate change, which is absolutely real, absolutely needs to be, needs to be dealt with on a number of levels, from national to local. And we need to start thinking about totally new models for housing, for, for re neighborhood retail, for adapting older buildings to new uses, creating community spaces that we can all share and enjoy as public shared living rooms, and going back to a long-standing tradition of this country, in this country of fine civic structures. Fine city halls, libraries, schools, community centers, the list is, is long. And then I wanna share with you, if we have time, with some specific tools um, to maybe help you in this thinking. Well, this chart, um, I've got a few charts here, uh, even though it may seem unusual as an architect that I would show you charts rather than, than cool photos. But this is, this is something that has been a, a long-term proposition in this country, and that is that our family sizes have been dropping dramatically 
the number of people in a household has been dropping substantially. In fact, the the American sort of mythology of the father, the mother, the mother, father, and two kids, that is now less than 25% of the population and going down. It is not going to be reversed. That is going down. Now, it may be re reversed 50 to 100 years, but that is a long-term shift, and it's consistently going down, decade after decade after decade. Meanwhile, the number of people in households, I mean, the number of households has gone up. They're just singles or couples that are forming households. Big, dramatic shift. It's something that a lot of folks in this country do not realize. This is a huge, I mean, it's changing preferences. It is driving all sorts of different decisions in the economy. And there are four groups that now constitute more than 60% of our population, and that is singles, individuals, single-parent households, seniors, and what I call startup households. That's young, young, young household couples um, that are just starting out in their life. They're not necessarily high income. They may be double income, but they're not necessarily high income at all. And that is, right now, more than 60% of the population. Those four groups are now driving our economy. They are, they are driving our economy in, in fundamentally different directions. But let's just pick one of those, and that's seniors, life expectancy. You know, we've forgotten about this, but a hundred and some years ago, people would start dying in their 50s. They would die at the plow, they'd die at the, at the, at the counter, the shop counter, they'd die at the factory. They'd just, they'd just keel over, at, in, in some time in their 50s. We've almost doubled life ex expectancy in a hundred years. People are living into their 80s and 90s, very handily now. You see this all the time. It's actually not even remarkable anymore to start seeing people living into their hundreds. That's just even a common um, news, news article that appears in the paper. Um, and that's because of all sorts of things. Um, preventative medicine, exercise, better diet, um, all sorts of uh, medical practices that are helping us live longer um, than we've ever done before. Well, now we have a substantial number of people that are going to be living 10, 20, maybe 30 years past what we've traditionally, at least in recent decades, considered to be retirement. What, you're going to have a third of your life past what we've thought of as a retirement age. What are you going to do with yourself? <laughs> what does that mean? What kind of income will you have? What kind of life will you live? Where will you live? In what will you live? These are, uh, these are questions that people, we're asking ourselves right now. And it's not the same pattern that we've had in the last 50 years. It's going to be different. And people are already making decisions to live differently, more effectively, more efficiently, more cost-effectively, if you will, than in the past. <clears throat> this is another thing that uh, the insurance companies know about, and that is, um, a friend of mine and that also writes for national publications calls this the Longhorn Steer Curve. And it indicates um, uh, the fatalities that have happened uh, with people driving below a certain age and above a certain age. And at some point, people just simply stop being able to drive. You can't pass the exam anymore. You don't have eye-hand coordination. You can't drive anymore. So what does that mean? Now you're suddenly without a vehicle. You are no longer mobile. Are we going to depend on somebody taking us everywhere, I th like a child? I think not. I think people will start to look for living opportunities where they can enjoy a full life and have things close at hand that they can walk to or take a bus to. Because they simply, we all of us, will simply cease being able to drive. Typically, late 70s, early 80s starts to happen. Happened to my own mother a number of years ago. She was helpless suddenly. What do I do? I can't drive anymore. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it starts to make you decide to do different things. One of the things that people are deciding to do is to not retire. Perhaps because you can't. You, you realize you don't have enough income in whatever savings or whatever retirement fund or whatever 401k. There isn't enough that you have to live another 10 to 20 to 30 years. So you have to go back to work. But a lot of people simply want to work. 
The, the whole idea of retirement even is beginning to change. When you retire, what you retire, maybe you retire from one career and start another. Or maybe you work part-time, or maybe you volunteer, or you have a combination of volunteering and a part-time job. This whole, in fact, a lot of employers like senior workers because they're dependable. They, they've had a life career in working. They understand the values of work. They show up dependably. They, they appreciate that, and that's why you see now in a lot of places, fast food places, restaurants, service workers, it's not the teenagers taking those jobs, it's older people taking those jobs. Because employers actually appreciate having that stability and experience in their businesses. You know, kids understand this today. And that's one reason why we've had, and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen this in the paper too, a dramatic drop and the number of teenage, teenage people owning cars. They're not interested in that anymore. They're not interested in that as we were when we were teenagers. That is dropping precipitously the number of miles driven and the number of car ownerships by that age group from teens into 20s. They're interested in doing other things. They're interested in living differently, biking, walking, living near where they work, living where near, near where they shop. They're looking for other things. Now, I'm not saying all are, that wouldn't be fair to say, but enough are that it's causing major shifts in the marketplace of people meeting those kinds of demands differently. But they know, they learn this in school, they memorize this, they know that this comes from the tailpipe. It is not a mysterious force that somehow just happens. It's generally coming from the tailpipe. They also begin to, to realize this, that if you live in a typical detached home with two cars operating, you're generating a substantial amount of CO emissions. If you drop to one car and live in a little denser, it drops in half. If you eliminate a car altogether, it's half again. So this is a matter of even personal choice. People are deciding to improve the environment by their own personal choice, their own personal decision making, and they're opting not to drive. That, that is a, it's a huge change in this culture that is a, a rippling through all aspects, of our, uh, all aspects of our economy. They're not even interested in getting a driver's license. My own daughter has no driver's license, not interested in it wants to do other things, has other kind, some other kind of ID, but has no interest in driving. And I'm, it's kind of shocking to me because I, I mean, she's in her mid-twenties. By, the, by then, I had already owned like four cars, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> this millennial group, which is now a quarter of our population, it's equal to the boomers, by the way. Boomers used to be the biggest single chunk. Now it, it's matched by the millennials. There's about a quarter each. They're living much, in a much different way. They're not interested in having a big house. They're not interested in having lots of stuff. They're interested in being mobile because they know they have to be to be able to go where the jobs are. They're not going to invest. That's why the, the rate of home ownership has dropped dramatically. They're more interested in renting because they know they have to be available where the next job might be. It could be anywhere in the country. They want to be ready to respond to those changes, those shifts in workplaces, those shifts in technology, the next new place, the next new Apple, the next new Microsoft. They want to be able to go there. They don't want to be tied down to a, with a mortgage. So there's a whole desire for a different form of housing that's quite, quite unlike anything we have seen, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, they basically don't live in their homes. They live in the street. In the, in the parks, in the, in the coffee houses, in the, in the places to hang out, in the community centers, in the rec centers, that's where they spend their lives. They're not spending it at home anymore, sitting on the couch watching TV. That's the old couch potato idea. That is not the millennial group. They're out being active, they're working longer hours, they're hanging out with friends, they're going to, to arts events, they're going to music events and they just don't need the big sp amount of space that we've traditionally associated with, with housing. Um, they're also delaying both marriage and childbirth, childbearing, deliberate, I mean, this has is, this is dropped dramatically in one decade. 
a single decade. That is, that is huge to have this kind of shift, a delay of five years in a single decade. Not interested in that so much anymore. But they're not wealthy, despite the sort of mythology of the Apple, you know, uh, employee or the Microsoft employees that starting out at 80,000, that is, that is just simply the rare person that you hear about or the myth, the urban legend or whatever, the, uh, their average income is down in the low 30s. That is almost poverty level, I mean, for, for at least a couple. So these are not necessarily well-off, wealthy people. They may be aggressive and eager and ready to go in the world and ready to make their place, but they're not necessarily on an average earning a lot of money. Now, what's their choice in terms of where they're going to live? Basically, that comes down to this. The mom's, uh, the mom's house or the, the parent's house with the childhood bedroom with the stuffed toys and the, and the high school pennants on the wall or a whole bunch of roommates in a house where you're fighting over the food and who's going to clean the toilet and all that. Neither of those are a great choice for anyone. Why would we force people into that, having that dilemma? And lots of households are seeing now kids come back when they're mid-20s, mid to late-20s, staying in, in, their, in their old childhood bedrooms or, or, or having the dilemma of the multiple roommates. So are there some other choices? And a lot of the folks in the millennial group are looking for walkable urban centers, not necessarily big cities. There's actually kind of an interesting phenomenon where they're even now looking at smaller towns but the, as a newspaper said recently, bringing Brooklyn with them. So they still want all the cool stuff, but they want to be in a nice, small, intimate community where they can walk to a lot of things. So I think there's, this is the opportunity for lots of communities now to, to look for new forms of economic development, to bring folks back into the community that didn't consider that before, because now it's got a nice main street, it's got shops and cafes and restaurants on the street, it's got a farmer's market, it's got an art center, it's got public art, things that are attractive and appealing to people in that age group. And I think a lot of communities now are beginning to turn to those, but they have to, they can't do it through their typical zoning code. They have to start rethinking what, the, what, what choices are available um, through those devices. Um, one of the things that's, that's got to change in zoning codes is um, the un, unusually high parking ratios. That's driving up the cost of housing unnecessarily, and as I said, fewer and fewer people are, at, at least in those age groups, driving. But yet those, parking, those suburban parking codes it still persist and exist and end up unnecessarily, needlessly driving up the cost of housing. And we need to get rid of the notion that parking is somehow an entitlement automatically that comes with each unit. And a number of developers are actually taking the parking separate from the rent now and saying, if you, if you want a parking space, we've got it here, but you're going to pay separately. So you see the cost of it. It's not hidden in your rent. You see the cost dramatically every month. You are paying 100, 150 a month for the privilege of that space. And people are, will say, you know, I might want to spend my money differently and opt out of that choice. Well, what are some development models that are, that are possible for the next couple of decades? This does not. One might be accessory dwelling units, a very easy way of slipping in a little more development opportunities quietly and softly into neighborhoods. Only a handful of people ever want to do this because if you imagine yourself converting a garage or adding over the garage or adding a unit in the basement, you're suddenly going to become a landlord, which is going to change your tax status. It's going to change, you know, you have to comply with laws of being a landlord tenant situation. Relatively few people will opt for this, but in communities that have allowed for accessory dwelling units to exist, it's somewhere in the name, neighborhood of 5 to 15 percent, maybe, of, of a typical neighborhood where you would see this. And they're usually so subtle. This is actually Snohomish, and it's filled with them. And you, unless you looked carefully down a driveway, you would even never know that there, were at, there was actually another unit in the back. And there's specific design controls to make sure that you don't have 
you know, it doesn't look like a duplex. There's not two front doors on the street. There's all sorts of things that you can put into a code for an accessory dwelling ordinance that ensures that it's not going to fundamentally change the character of that area. But yet you allow for, and the thing that's interesting about this model is that the house, the big house might start out where it typically would be the widow in it alone now, and the widow moves to the back unit, and the front unit becomes available to a new family to start their life cycle. And then there's a social interaction where, you know, maybe the, 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 the widow takes care of the couple's kids when they want to go out on a date, or the, the couple takes care of the, 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 the elderly woman by bringing her food, you know, doing shopping for her. So you get this great sense of social interaction and responsibility, and not just simply a housing type, but it's sort of a, a, a new social form too. Cottage housing going on all over the region. Um, a lot of communities that now that have cottage housing ordinances, and there are a lot of developers that cannot build this fast enough. It's a return back to the starter home, the small house where a lot of us grew up in. I mean, I went back to visit my, um, the house I grew up in, Pasadena, a while back. I was shocked at how small that thing was, and yet there were four people that lived in it. Now, these are actually designed for singles or couples, or say a, a single mom with a, with, a, with a child, because these are pretty small. Um, but there are, there are cottage developments that are their work, they're very popular, uh, but you'd also need to make sure that you've got appropriate design controls so that these don't, there are not too many units, they, they don't you know, go run rampant in a neighborhood and change the character, but you can do that. And there's certainly a lot of experience now in this region with this form of development. Um, townhouses are increasingly popular. I actually call them single family attached because they are often fee simple ownership, just with a common wall. And that, that's, that's not a huge change. It's not stacked flats, it's not apartments, it's not you know, super high density. It just slides into a neighborhood in a two to three story um, configuration. Um, this is also something that's getting, you've probably even seen some press on this recently. The micro units, it's actually a phenomenon that's very rapidly sweeping across the country and it is aimed specifically at millennial group or perhaps senior people that are now alone and they want, it, they want to downsize, they, tire, they want to travel instead of taking care of a home. And so these are very small units that are tucked into neighborhoods, not, not tall buildings, they're you know, just a few stories. Uh, but this is a, a whole, this is a rethinking of sort of a housing type that we haven't even seen before. And there's some communities that they wouldn't allow this because it depends on a re reduced parking ratio. They probably only make sense where you've got transit nearby as an option. But we now have that in a lot of communities. We have either light rail, commuter rail, bus, or other forms of transit where this can make a lot of sense. I wouldn't suggest it everywhere. That's probably a mistake that's going on, is that people are trying to put it in the wrong locations. Um, the, the return to neighborhood retail, we really have to figure out how to nurture the best of American capitalism, which is small family-owned businesses. And we've set everything up to treat the big guys well, and almost nothing to treat the small people well. And we just really have to reverse that because that is, that is what our contribution is to the world, is small scale entrepreneurial capitalism that comes out of a family based business. We have immigrants as we've always had in this country that understand this really well. We've, that's, that's always the way that, that we've sort of introduced new people into our economy through that. But we have a lot of things that frankly discourage that. We have, high, again, high parking ratios. We have all sorts of other codes. We have things that just make it very difficult for small businesses to operate. Some people can operate really well in two to 300 square feet. That's all they need. And yet we keep building big spaces as if, as, as, as if national brands were the only type of retailer that go, goes into the development. Um, we need to even take a look at some of the older buildings that we've got around that we've kind of thought of as kind of dumb and ugly and see if we can rethink them. Like this is a great restaurant that's in a Quonset hut. I mean, something left over from World War II and it's a fun and funky kind of place and immensely popular in this community. Um, and those kinds of opportunities, and we just need to re recapture and rethink some of these assets that are maybe hidden in the community. 
Public spaces, absolutely important. This is where people are now hanging out, the parks and plazas and squares. I mean, uh, the, uh, and a, a prime example nearby is the, the great park, uh, Pioneer Park in Puyallup, which has the market building and city hall and everything and the art surrounding that. And that didn't exist 20 years ago. I mean, it basically is a phenomenon that was created by the city, by city action and city investment. And it has made a huge difference in the, the livability and identity of that city. Um, I mentioned civic structures, but we also we need, need to rethink our street standards. And this is not zoning. This is development standards that public works departments use. We need to substantially rethink those because all we've been doing for the past 50 years is paving the world with asphalt and concrete. We've got to knock it off. We've got to rethink streets as complete streets. I'm sure you've heard that term. That embody lots of different values that take the, take the storm water and treat it, infiltrate it, let it get back into the ground, that, that narrow the, the amount of asphalt that's, that's used, that broadens the amount of space available for people on foot. And communities are doing this right now, and they're getting help doing it. It's not just taking it out of their general fund. They're getting grants. They're getting assistance to rebuild major streets all over. Um, Every community needs to have a good, solid set of design standards that supplements their zoning ordinance. Zoning by itself, one of the great tragedies of zoning is it will never produce quality on its own. Absolutely never. It's a quality neutral. There is a 50% chance of being bad as, there, as it is being good. Zoning will not produce quality. And it's just about numbers. It's about quantities. It's about numbers of parking stalls. It's about heights of buildings. That is not qualitative. What, what is required is a set of design standards that supplement that, that speak to the qualitative aspects of the community and the neighborhood, so that you get development fitting in well and not dramatically changing the character. So density can happen without necessarily damaging a place. And then this is a final slide, and it's, it was based on, on uh, a notion that I had a few years ago that we've had a neighborhood um, ideal neighborhood unit, so to speak, an idea of a, of, of, a, of a neighborhood based around an elementary school. It's been around for about 80 years in our literature and, and just sort of popular mythology that we need to base neighborhoods around schools. Well, that's really not our demographics anymore. I mean, those schools are important, all schools are important at all levels, but that's not really not the center of life. I mean, it may be in our popular mythology it is, it, it is but no longer is it really the center of life in most of our communities. What, what often is the center of life is the supermarket. We all need food. We need food on a weekly basis. We go, to, go there now to meet friends, often have coffee, to buy flowers, to buy art, to buy, I mean, we're doing other things there. They're, it's not your grandmother's supermarket. It's as much a community center almost as anything else. And so this is actually, the, the, in this, this particular model, the, uh, the supermarket is dead center. Um, it's the letter A, and it just shows other things that over time could swirl around that in terms of creating a main street, of adding for a variety of, of allowing for a variety of housing choices from single family to row house to, to stacked flats, and to include all of the other things. So this is a self-contained, walkable community, and you can do everything in life on foot. You might still have a car, but you're not using it as much as walking about, which after all is also great exercise. So. That's what I want to uh, end on, of sort of a potential vision for the future. Not that this needs to be a template or something repeated endlessly, but just the idea of rethinking our neighborhoods, our cities, our downtowns around a different set of factors that will carry us into this coming century. Thank you.